Welcome to State of Our Art Podcast, the internet radio show exploring music of the past, present, and future. Here's your host, conductor Thomas Fortner. Hello, everybody. Please welcome Pete Foliard. Uh, Pete Foliard is the, uh, the new inaugural dean of the School of Music. He holds an undergraduate degrees, two undergraduate degrees in music education and instrumental performance from University of North Texas, master's degree in instrumental performance and conducting from my alma mater, the Peabody Institute of Johns Hopkins University, and a doctorate of music arts degree in orchestral conducting from the Eastman School of Music. Uh, Mr. Foliard, Dr. Foliard has held professional conducting positions with the United States Air Force Band in Washington, D.C., and the Rochester Philharmonic, and has taught at the Juilliard School and the Crane School of Music prior to joining the Augustana University faculty. In addition to his conducting and teaching, uh, Dr. Foliard is an active producer of multimedia recording projects and an author. His recording projects include releases on Naxos and Lynn record labels, as well as self-released albums direct to social media platforms. His book, The Bach Initiative, which we will be using this semester, is published with GIA Music, which allows instrumentalists of all transpositions immediate access to the score for intuitive study and performance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the very first time to our symposium, Dr. Pete Folliard. Hey, everybody. Pete. Thanks for having me, Tom. I appreciate it. You bet. So uh, let's hear a little bit about your background. You've clearly done a lot of things, but what, what, was the, what made you fall in love with music? What was the, the, the hook for you? Yeah, Tom, I can't imagine a time where it wasn't very prevalent in my life. I, so it goes back to as early as memory starts for me. Um, but I, I guess we should start with what my parents were about. They're music lovers, but not musicians. So my father is a, was a chemist. He's retired now, um, but chemist, but an opera buff at the same time tone deaf. So this guy could tell you the plot of every single major opera. And he grew up in Manhattan. So he went to go see them all starting in his 20s. And... Uh, but he could, he could tell you every single, oh, this is what this aria is about. And, oh, I remember this time where I saw um, UC Bureling do whatever. I mean, it was just this, this incredible history of, this guy saw Leonard Bernstein's mass conducted by Bernstein because it was so politically unpopular that he could pick up a ticket in the day of. Now that said, yeah. growing up when he would go see me sing in a church choir, uh, he wouldn't even open his mouth because he couldn't, he can't hold a tune. So I grew up with watching my dad weep to these amazing classical performances that he would play on his awesome record collection. And at the same time, he would never make a noise. And then you've got my mom on the other side who was an avid choral musician, but she was a linguist. So I think there's an interesting tie about um, the ear of a linguist and what they pick up on uh, in association with music, there's so much fine tuning to hearing accents and inflection. I think that there's there's a neat tie in there. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot there that, that's connected. But my mom also grew up in New York City. Um, she played the clarinet all throughout high school. She thought about being a music major, but she had other friends that she saw had more raw talent than her. And she thought, you know, I am not as talented as that maybe I'm not going to make that what it is that I want to do. So I've always been able to check in with my parents and share my love of music with them and they appreciate it. But they're also not in my chili about like, oh, well, did you make sure that you practiced, you know, with the metronome on at you know, half tempo and then work your, that never happens. So um, it started really young, Tom. I, I, again, I can't remember a time that it wasn't there. So that's the beginning. And then I started taking piano lessons and violin lessons when I was about four and I'll be completely honest, they were Suzuki lessons, really, I think, valuable for me to be immersed at that age. But I didn't start taking music lessons seriously until I was eight years old. Uh, and at that point, I had a phenomenal teacher that I studied with consistently for eight years uh, up until I was 16. And then when I was 16, somehow I found this instrument called the euphonium and I fell in love with it. And I felt like I needed to choose at that point. And one of the things that sort of rubbed me the wrong way about my piano playing is I would sweat my hands off practicing Beethoven. And I remember my first gig that I had, I was in fourth grade and uh, it was myself and another gentleman named Sean Connor. Sean just won his first Grammy 
uh, two years ago with uh, Third Coast Percussion. He's one of the founding members of that. So Sean and I were, he was in fifth grade, I was in fourth grade. We played this piano auction together and I played some Chopin Nocturne, you know, being in fourth grade. That, that's, a, that's a cool thing to do. Yeah. And he played The Piano Man uh, by Billy Joel and his tip jar filled up fast. And I remember having a chip on my shoulder about that. And so when I got to high school and I found the euphonium and I was working on this really difficult solo piano rep, I thought, you know, I'm more talented, I think, and there's less competition on the euphonium. Let me pursue that avenue and let me put the piano down because I can sight read the Billy Joel stuff. Um, and that was a mistake to, to look backwards. Uh, I resumed piano lessons when I got back to college. Uh, in my third year of college, I was like, I really missed this. And that was the right thing. So uh, if I can pass on any bit of wisdom, the first thing would be piano lessons always. And then at that, um, make yourself a verse in many styles. Don't just play Bach and Beethoven. That will inform how you can play Billy Joel or what Michael Jackson, whatever it is that you want to play on the keyboard. Um, that classical technique will help you, but oh my gosh, play the piano, please. You know, that's, that's a great advice that I wish I had heard when I was about eight, because I, I started piano and was very serious about it. And then my teacher moved, she left town, um, must have been, I must've been something I did said, I don't know. And, uh, and then I switched to cello and I stopped taking piano lessons. And I tell you right now, as a conductor, uh, I, I regret that decision. Right my life a lot easier so I'm, I'm actually taking piano lessons again now so i think that's the move right it, for any of us that love music whatever it is that you do it's like taking swimming lessons for anybody like that's a life skill that you want to have a piano or keyboard chops are an essential musical life skill and it's, it seems like you've balanced a lot of different instruments growing up um a, a number of our uh of our students also do the same thing how do you balance the, the, the need of, I mean, because clearly you played the violin and the piano and then you sing in choir. How did you organize everything? And, and when it came time to, to start auditioning for colleges, how did that all work out for you? So the quick answer to your question is it came down to where I found this deep connection with the most, with passion, you know, like, oh my gosh, I just love playing this instrument. I loved playing instruments. I loved making music. Um, that was the extracurricular that always was like, this isn't work, this is so much fun. This is what I wanna do. And I liked the people that I was doing it with. But once I found the euphonium, which was uh, at the end of seventh grade, that's when I was like, oh man, like I wanna keep doing this. And I think I could be good. So not only did I feel like I had a natural talent in that particular area, I also surveyed the field to see who else was playing that instrument. So. Uh, my switch to the euphonium came from, I was playing the flute at that time, and I was the principal flautist of middle school band. That's not really even a position, right? You just, yeah. um, you just sit yourself there. So um, I had had it being, I took flute lessons. I was really serious about it. And I remember I was working on some Haydn Sonata um, that, you know, I, I thought I was hot stuff. And, and I had just had it with the Gabby girls that were sitting in the front row that didn't take it seriously, that were looking at their nails and whatever. And I just well, went up. <laughs> yeah. So I went up to the band director after class and I said, I quit. And she was like, whoa, like what? And I said, yeah, I quit. And um, she said, no, you don't quit. Uh, you're gonna You're gonna play the baritone. And I said, the baritone, like, and I looked back and I saw my two really good friends, Henry Joyce and Andrew Bedreski. And they, one of them, uh, Henry played the tuba and Andrew played the trombone. I would have been sitting right between them. And I went, I love those guys. And it's, I, I found my affinity with the people that I was sitting with, but then I was also, I was the only baritone player. So I could be the best without having to worry about other people holding me back. And that suited me really well. And so, yeah, again, I guess it came down to looking at where I could be successful as well as what was really enriching for me personally, it connected with me, and then the people that I was sitting among, all that felt right. Yeah. So, yeah, I I, I feel the there's there's something about the personality of every instrument. Uh, I I I didn't know this about you that you played the flute. I I would have never would have guessed. <laughs> 
Yeah. I it it's up on my shelf still somewhere. Like yeah. it's, I still have it. Yeah. So I'm not, a, I'm not a flute personality. That's not me. Right. I, I think, I think you're right. The people tend to gravitate towards things. It, it's a really, it's a really great thing to have a, a broad depth of knowledge, particularly if you're going to be a conductor or, or a music educator. Um, but it's also really important to excel, particularly at one instrument. Would you say that you, you excelled at eventually at one that we sort of let? I did. Yeah. I mean, so it was the piano level. first and always, um, always the piano and everybody always wants to hear you play the piano. You know, the piano is one of those things. It sits around in people's houses. It's, it's like a piece of furniture. It's around. So if you could sit down and play, you would. Um, but then the euphonium, I, I just was excelling so quickly uh, with some sort of natural ability. I remember uh, that director, her name was Mary Schneider. Um, and uh, she now is the director of bands at uh, Central Michigan. Uh, so Mary, uh, at that time, uh, Miss Schneider would, um, she gave me the instrument. I had 45 minutes and I came back and I played her a B flat major scale. Like, and I mean, that that's like, yeah, you know, that's what everybody's goal is in their first semester, I think, of uh, yeah. learning an instrument. And I had it down in 45 minutes. So I think that's natural for any human being to gravitate towards something that they're good at, right? Um, if you find that you're talented in something, keep doing that. That's a good idea. So you eventually decided to, to pursue this, uh, this music thing in college. What, what caused you to decide to make that, that career choice? Yeah, so I was, I remember a conversation when I was in high school where I was telling a friend's grandmother who asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, oh, it's either psychology or, or music. And she just sort of went, come on, Pete, you're going to do music. You know, you're going to do music. And I was like, yeah, I, I know. I'm gonna do. And I was so excited that that was an avenue that you could pursue as a degree. So I remember I asked my parents for a euphonium CD uh, my sophomore year of high school. And they got me this CD by this gentleman named Brian Bowman. And I was blown away. I mean, so imagine playing through an MP3 so many times that it gets worn down. Um, Cause that's kind of what I did with it, with a CD to the point where, you know, it was so scratched up from being with me on a CD Walkman to the car CD yeah. player to the CD. And I mean, it was just so beat up. Um, but this was the beginning of email and I emailed Brian Bowman. He was at the University of North Texas. Um, and there's a long connection here. Brian Bowman was uh, a major euphonium soul was with the Air Force bands back in the 70s and the 80s. And, um, and that's where the euphonium finds its professional home. So this whole military band connection kind of makes sense out of this. But um, I emailed him. I said, I've, I've heard your CD and I just, I, I have to meet you. And he said, well, I teach this summer camp and I was, it was going to be my junior year. He said, this is a great opportunity for us to meet. And so I went to the summer camp. It was in Oklahoma at Oklahoma University. And uh, the people that were there was Sam Palathian, who uh, passed away uh, last year, uh, Empire Brass tubist. He's the tuba player that you hear on the LA Philharmonics recording of the planets. That's like, yeah. it's gotta be one of the best. With, with, it, that's an amazing recording. Um, uh, he was the tuba player for Bernstein's Mass on that recording. Um, and then the Empire Brass founding member. So Sam Palavian was there, Ted Cox, who was the tuba professor, Brian Bowman was the euphonium professor, and a young woman at that time named Deanna Swoboda, who is now the uh, low brass instructor at Arizona State University, a major top-notch school of music uh, in our country. So there I was meeting these people who at that point were still, you know, pretty young. And I, I was like, oh my gosh, even more so, Tom, this is my community. Like I'm with a bunch of people who like fart jokes, you know, like that's, that's a low brass person. Um, yeah. So uh, anyways, it, Brian Bowman said, Peter, I think you'd be a wonderful fit at our studio at the University of North Texas. I hope you come down for a live audition next fall. Uh, I certainly did that and uh, was accepted, got a big scholarship and off I went. So that's where that, that's where that started. But I was just so excited that that was an option that, oh my gosh, this is something that I, Tom, I was practicing at least five hours a day and probably the instrument was on my face eight hours a day through playing in jazz band, concert band, marching band. Um, the idea that I could do this and that's what most of my classes would be were music theory and keyboard skills and lessons and chamber music. It was like, why would I not do that? That sounds awesome. That, that, let's segue to, to some 
to something related to that, which is what is music school like? And, and I know that we have uh, a number of people in this, this youth orchestra that are considering a future um, in music and primarily in music school. So talk about what, why should somebody study music at, in a college? Yeah, so one, no matter what it is that you're doing, right? These people that you make music with now those are your people, you know, you're the same type of, I'm going to say this affectionately, you're the same type of nerd and nerd is a good word. You know, you're the same type of, uh, you love the same type of things. You've had that chill before from listening or playing music where that's a, that's a unique experience that not everybody even gets in their lifetime. And we, we seek that out all the time because we've had that and we know how good it is. So you're with those people. That's fun. Um, so, if, if music is something that you want to do for a career, you've got to go this route. If music is something that you want to conti continue as part of your life, you want to go to a school that has an outstanding music program. So what does that entail? You've got, I'd say, three different pieces associated with that. The most important, if you want to be a performer, is that there's a teacher for your instrument that you really revere, respect, want to study with, that you jive with. So you would email them get a lesson with them, whether it's uh, a virtual lesson or you can actually make it out to that place and study with them. That's, that's piece number one. Piece number two is the ensembles that they have there. So you wanna look for a place that has a strong choir and or orchestra and or band and any, any of those, but the more that they have strength in all of those areas, the better. And then the last piece is they're going to have a, an academic component to that. And so, your academic component within music is you've got music theory, you've got aural skills, A-U-R-A-L, aural skills, which is ear training. So if I play, there you go. Not only do I know that's happy birthday, if I told you that if you have perfect pitch, good for you, but if I told you the starting note was G, you could sit down and go, oh yeah, I can write that out. Um, and you've got music history, you've got, uh, what else is in there? You've got music technology, which is becoming more and more robust, something that we do at Augustana really well. Um, music history, music theory, those are the big cores that, that you see. Uh, and then again, your lessons and your ensemble. So those are the three parts that make up a, a music degree. And we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this a little bit. We'll, we'll, um, you're the brand new dean of the brand new School of Music at Augustana, uh, yet to be named, um, <laughs> which is really exciting. So we'll talk a little bit a bit more at the end of this interview about the program, um, which is right here in our backyard. But I, I want to highlight one specific area, which in general, there are some people that are on the fence about whether they want to study music because they don't know what kind of career it can lead to. But what about those folks who want to keep their options open and they maybe they don't want to put all of their eggs in the music basket? Which, what is your advice to them? I, I'm going to be really blunt about this. I think those people are really smart. Uh, it's music education has done a really good job since about 1940 of training people to either wear concert black for the rest of their life or teach music like in high school. And if you're so inclined and all the cards fall in the right place, because there's so much good fortune, good timing to this thing. Um, that over time you may end up being a Thomas Fortner, uh, being, uh, I, that's so cool that we can say that, Tom, that we're like, oh my gosh, we're doing what it is that we aim to do. And I hope that people who are listening to our conversation here are like, no, I, I aspire to be uh, like Pete and more so. I, I wanna go, I can do that and I can, I can go beyond that. Um, that's what I thought when I used to watch things like this. So uh, Tom, take me back to your original question here uh, of, well, so basically I'm kind of going towards music minor and, and the balance and, and what, what would be the value? Um, or I would say double major, to be honest, right? If you're, if you're already participating in the South Dakota Symphony Youth Orchestra, you've got a talent, like, come on, don't, don't kid yourself. You and your family have invested time, uh, money, resources into you and your music. Uh, I'd, I'd strongly encourage you to think, yeah, I could double major in music and something. Um, so I think that's a really good idea. Music minor, essentially, you're going to get, when I talked about theory and um, history and things like that, you'll only take about two years of the coursework for that, but you won't go into the advanced stuff like conducting and things like that. That's what you'd see in a music major. That stuff is super fun where you begin to holistically tie together 
all of the stuff that you got in those first two years into even more applied areas. Like, so let's say for a music minor, you had to take four semesters of lessons. Well, that's cool, but what if you wanted to do a recital? And by the way, you got degree credit for that recital. That's where we holistically tie together all of the work that you've done in those first two years. So the minor is going to give you those core skills. The major is going to build on that so that you can either go directly into graduate school or you can, you know, if, if you're one of the talented, super talented ones that can go land a job directly from undergrad, one good for you. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that's the goal for a music degree to prepare you for something like that. So. Yeah, Tom, to answer your question, I think if you're not sure you want to put all your eggs in the music basket, one, good for you. I think that's a really wise move, but that doesn't mean to not do music. It just means it's music and, and always explore in any of the options that you're doing. How can I do both and? I think that's always a good way to approach problem solving because it's never an either or situation. So what, what value do you think the study of music has on somebody who might become an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or an underwater basket weaver or uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a two and a half year old daughter and um, I'm going to say something that I, I hope doesn't come out the wrong way. I, I want to give her all of the musical opportunities and love for music that I have. And if she chooses to pursue music, um, God knows I'll help her in every way that I can, but I'd be very okay with her not choosing music as a path. Um, it's, it's, it's a difficult road um, with worthwhile challenges, but, but a lot of challenges, as opposed to let's talk about the careers that are available for a doctor, an engineer, uh, or whatever. You, you know, just hop online and type, you know, career openings for and type doctor and you can get a, you can get a job. And then the, uh, the base pay also is an issue. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Those are, um, those are realistic things that you have to yeah. think about. You know, it, this is not a career that's going to make you a lot of money being a musician, but you're going to be happy. Um, you, you might be poor. <laughs> and if, if money is what makes you happy, um, I guess one, check your values, but two, uh, you know, maybe something else is the right move for you there. But so here's what I hope for my daughter you know, which is what I would share with everybody is that uh, I just had a conversation with my wife last weekend about how Mackenzie will take piano lessons, you know, and it's, it's so that just imagine the fine motor skills and the synthesis of heart, mind, um, body of, okay, I'm going to take this work by Chopin. I'm going to intuit it into my being so that it means something to me emotionally. I'm going to train my body through it's one of the only things that we still have today that the only way to get there is by chiseling away at it slowly piece by piece there's no i just woke up and i could do it you know that's called a prodigy and there's and even those people will tell you that they sweat hard in learning their uh in learning their craft you know mozart was very gifted you know uh that but he was making music 29 hours a day you know so <laughs> It's not like he, it's not like he didn't work hard. So what I want Mackenzie to have is this ability to, again, whatever it is that she's doing, holistically blend, harnessing the control of her body, of her mind and of her spirit into whatever it is applied that she's doing. So if she becomes a doctor or a surgeon, or if she becomes, um, you know, a, a sanit sanitary worker where she's picking up garbage, um, one, all of these are admirable jobs if you approach them with a sense of purpose. And if, if she can intuit, I, I'm going to keep going down this avenue to see if I can, you know, talk myself out of it. But let's say she is a trash collector. What, how can she blend body, mind, and, and abilities to make that work valuable and more efficient over time so that eventually... I, I don't know. Um, that's so important. And I think music is really one of the few things that allows you to blend in spirit as well as mind and body, right? Athletics are great for mind and body control. Your body says, I don't want to do this anymore. And your mind says, yeah, but I told you to do it and do it faster or harder. But where does the spirit and soul come in in that? And then where does the history and lineage of like, 
I'm holding this score of Beethoven right now. And I get to share this through my, I mean, that, nothing else has that, I don't think, you know? Yeah, I, 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 I preach the same thing that, that music is one of the, the very few um, activities that you can do that connects the right and the left brain, the analytical side, one of those sides, and the, I guess it's over here, and the, the, the heart, soul side, yeah. the emotional side, the creative side. Um, and we, we, we've talked a lot about creativity. Uh, my kids are going to hear me preach even more about it this year. It's going to be a major component. We're actually, um, for my yoga groups, we're going to be writing a song. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about, about what you learned in college and, and how that is, uh, and I'll, I'll tie that into Augustan, how that has informed your, your career. Uh, obviously, you went on to the Air Force Band and you've done record producing. So it seems like you had a very varied experience in college that, that inspired you to do all of these, you know, being a conductor and a dean of a school of music and in the Air Force and a record producer and an author. How did that all could have come together and where did that come from? Uh, all right. So the one word I think in all of that that unifies it is, is leadership that I always sought. Um, <laughs> this might be uh, I don't know how many of people that hear this, this will resonate with them, but I often watch, I still watch people, um, but I watched people and I thought, geez, I could do that better. <laughs> and and uh, I remember that sitting in the back row of the band and thinking, this person is not hearing as much as I'm hearing. I could make more valuable use of my colleagues' time mm -hmm. if I were in charge. Um, and. Or, or if we did it my way, which sounds really um, self-centered. It, 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 it isn't intended to do that. I, I think we're all imbued with some sense of like, I want to be in charge. So th there's some sick narcissism, I guess, associated right. with that. But it, it, I, I hope that I'm, I'm humble. Um, so, you know, all the things that you mentioned, Tom, that are part of my, you know, musical circle, I think that I go back to thinking about somebody like Bach, who was, I always say this, a musician with a capital M. This gentleman was a father, a teacher, a church musician, a composer, a businessman. I mean, uh, he had to be in order to survive. And it's all of those things that made Bach Bach. Um, you know, Mozart was not a good businessman, but he could write so much music and was in so much demand that at least he could survive for as, as short a lifetime as he did making his career in music. So um, let's see if, if we were to track the, the path of all of this. So I, you know, I, I got you up to, I met Brian Bowman. I go to the University of North Texas because that's where he's teaching. So going back, they have the things that I was looking for of a great private lesson teacher and outstanding ensembles. So I'm there. The academics, I'm like, you know, whatever. I just want to study music. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, so I start doing that. Um, I was in a place of high competition, 2000 music majors at North Texas. So you could have a thousand that just weren't very good. You could have 500 that were good and then you could have 500 that were elite and you could compete at either one of those levels. You know, you could be the best of the not good. You could be the best of the, yeah, we're okay. And then you could be the best of those that had super duper talent. Um, it was a, a full range of, of, you know, all the weights of boxing class. So, you know, you want to fight for heavyweight, go for it. You want to fight for middleweight, go for it. That was good for me um, to be among a lot of people. And for some people, that's not the best. At some point in your life and career, you need to play the little fish in a big pond game. I think the longer, the better. Um, and the reality is, unless you choose to live in New York City or Los Angeles, um, you're not going to end up living in that big pond. Uh, and that's a good thing. You know, once you learn how to do those swimming techniques in those larger ponds, you get to those smaller ponds and people see when they're like, that cat can swim. So um, let's, all right. So let me see if I can break this apart. Um, music performance. Uh, what I learned quickly was if you want to be a musician at some point, uh, if you want to be a performer at some point, you need to be practicing eight hours a day. I don't know for how long that needs to happen, but 
that's not an absolute number. You don't need to check the box. But I think what that says is that means a third of my day, like I'm practicing. Now practicing means listening to music. It means, um, it means watching um, your lessons. It means actual time playing scales and all that. So you don't have to physically be, you know, on your instrument or, or playing for eight hours, but eight hours of day needs to be dedicated to your craft. Right. Um, that was huge for me in, in learning that. And I did that and that made me good. You have to be credible, right? So um, you must be a great performer on your instrument, no matter what. So there was one piece of, okay, I'm gonna do that. Then North Texas had a history of recording and I was interested in always recording my own lessons. And so when the ensembles, when, particularly when the wind symphony would record, I would wander into the recording booth where uh, a conductor who wasn't conducting on that piece was sitting there with headphones and essentially doing error detection. Nope, second clarinet, second bar of measure uh, of, of the second movement, uh, that B flat in the six sixteenth note of the measure was a little bit sharp. I was like, wow, how did he hear that? I want to be able to do that. And so that same idea of, you know, you looking at other people and thinking that you can do more than them or be better than them, you want to find more people that you want to aspire to be like. And so this was Dennis Fisher um, was his name. And uh, so I, I did that a whole bunch. And then when I got I knew I wanted to be a conductor because that would put me in charge of not wasting my peers time. I had all these musicians that I respected and I thought that was like, yeah, they're just sitting here and they're not getting as much out of this time as they could. So conducting seemed like the right move for that. Um, and I went to the Peabody Conservatory um, and there the band director Harlan Parker did a recording every single year and he made his graduate assistants be producers of the recording session. And so there I was for the first time saying, hey, beat two, yeah. uh, second clarinet, you're a little sharp right there. You know, I mean, that, that was cool. I got my feet wet doing that. And that's what school is for. You get those opportunities. But the way that that translated was I won a job conducting the United States Air Force Band. And in my audition, they wanted to show us, um, oh, we're doing a recording session. You guys should all come check this out. And I went into the booth and I'm listening and the producer let something slip by where I went, hey, wait a second, beat two, clarinet, you know, it's a little sharp right there. And I, I had credibility because I had been there, done that. So I kept on sort of pursuing this recording piece at the same time. Um, but, you know, I was, I was a fine euphonium player still, uh, a pianist, a very functional pianist, and now a conductor. So here I was as a quadruple threat. Um, and, and there I am again, going back to what I said about Bach being all of these things that made me more in demand than somebody else. And that's how I would get a job like that. Um, being a conductor is, hey, we need you to do this and that and this and that. So the Air Force really trained me in not, they said, we hired you because you can do those things, but now we need to teach you leadership in a military capacity, which was, amazing to be honest i mean just they have documents after documents that are federal documents about leadership development they send you to leadership training and i found it very valuable um it, that was not a career that was going to work for my family but uh, i'm glad i had those four years in the air force band and when i got out to then go to do my doctorate at eastman i had all of i had now conducted professionally i had been producing records now as a professional for four years I had all of this training and leadership and writing and communications. So when I went to go do my, uh, apply for my doctorate, I had professional experience now um, and I had been making good money for a little while. So it was conceivable to be in my uh, late twenties and going back to, uh, going back to school. Uh, school. Graduate school is an expensive endeavor. Uh, school is an expensive endeavor. And so um, then at Eastman, that was the first time that I found myself as the little fish in a big pond where I went, there's a lot of bigger fish out here and I can keep up with these guys and girls, mm -hmm. but I think I, I think I might see the difference now between who's going to make it to the New York Philharmonic and me. That was the first time that I saw that was like, Oh, 
it was my aspiration still at that point to, to be the conductor of the New York Philharmonic. And I think all of us, especially the younger we are, need to have those gigantic goals. However, at some point you hit your ceiling um, and you should always keep pushing above that. But that's the first time that I went, I'm not going to be the conductor of the New York Phil because I don't have a photographic memory and crazy perfect pitch. I have really great relative pitch, but I can't, I can't do that. And that's when I realized when we would have a guest conductor uh, like Leonard Slackton come in and he doesn't have the score and he's saying, yeah, second clarinets measure two, that should be a B flat. I always have the score in front of me. My ears worked well enough to do that. So, um, you know, that's when you stand back and you go, wow, this person just, and you listen, you look back and you see Leonard Slackin's father was Frank Sinatra's concert master. And you go, this guy had a different leg up in life than I did, you know? Um, so it, it's okay where we all are and where we all come into the world is, is, is a, is a blessing. So you, you take what you got and you work with it. So the author piece of it, I guess, is, is all, um, a happy accident, I suppose. I, uh, when I was with the Air Force Band, um, I found that the string orchestra really didn't play very well in tune or with a sense of uh, real musicianship and ensemble. And I thought I could make it better by doing Bach. Um, and so I brought in a set of Bach chorales. I could go over to the shelf right now and pull it out and had them read uh, off the piano score. And of course they were music professionals. They can read treble clef and bass clef, no problem. And when I came to Augustana, uh, and I did the same thing because the orchestra didn't play very well at that time. I passed out the piano score and the violists raised their hand and said, well, which part do I play? Uh, they read in alto clef. Uh, so I then made the parts in alto clef and then I went, wait a second, I could do this for B flat parts and F parts and E flat parts. And then I submitted it to a publisher and said, this should be available. And they said, we totally agree. And poof, a, a year later, a book was published, which was super cool. Um, so happy accident, um, born out of, uh, I guess it all goes back to Bach, which isn't a bad thing. So, yeah. And so we're actually going to be playing some of this, uh, Bach arrangements, these Bach arrangements that you've put together. That's awesome. Yes. That's great. It's that it's, music doesn't get any better than that. Especially in a, in a COVID riddled season where we have to reconfigure our ensembles, it comes in really handy to have, um, transposable parts and, um, later this season, kids will be talking more about the, the value and what we're going to be doing with this music. Um, later on, we're going to have uh, an, a Vern Falby, one of our uh, professors at, at, at Peabody, yeah. talked about thinking by ear, and he talked a lot about Bach and the uses of that. So we'll get into that. It's a little teaser. Um, in the time remaining, Pete, let's talk about the brand new School of Music. How was it born? This is at Augustana. And what is your vision for the future? And what do you currently offer? Yeah, I appreciate you asking that. So I am excited and honored to be in this new leadership role here as we've grown a school of music. So what does that mean? Like in, in the short term, you know, we were a department of music, now we're a school of music. In, in the most basic ways, um, the, the idea here is that the university has elevated us to receive different attention than the rest of the university. So they've made a school of education and they've made a school of music. That means that uh, number one, they have a dean. So they, they did a dean search and I applied for the job and was fortunate enough to, to be put in there. And uh, I think the reason why I got the position was my vision for the future, which is today's musician needs to do it all. I, I guess I've been preaching that the whole time here. Um, so, and what does do it all mean? It means that you can play, it means that you can sing, it means that you can compose, it means that you can take it all to a computer with your cell phone as a video camera and you can create a trailer and get that up on a website. And like, how do you do all that? You know, I mean, I've learned it through knowing that that's what I needed. Now I want us to teach that because it is systematic. There's a better way to do that uh, than just school of hard knocks and figuring it out by the time you're, you know, in your mid to late thirties, that's not, that's not helpful. So I want to equip musicians now to have the immediate skill set. So what does that mean? Um, first, duh, study your instrument like a, like a pro. Second, we're gonna take some fundamental courses that you need in theory. Um, I'm gonna put the history piece to the side for a little bit. I think it's really important, but you're gonna get history in a variety of contexts throughout your education. Um, 
But then I want to focus on technology, particularly uh, music notation software, uh, audio recording software, and then video editing software. So uh, we're going to be embracing Avid suite of products. So that's uh, Pro Tools for audio, Media Composer for video, and Sibelius for music notation. So a, a course could be that you take, like, imagine this was your day, okay? You woke up in the morning, you practiced for a little bit, then you're gonna go to your course in video editing. Awesome. Then you're gonna go to your course in audio editing. Awesome. Then you're gonna go to music theory. Then you're gonna have lunch. Then you're gonna have your private lesson. Then you're gonna have your ensemble and that's your day. And I look at that, I'm like, that is my day. <laughs> that, that's what I do. Um, I wake up in the morning and I play the piano and uh, I do score reading every morning, uh, which is a theoretical practice in, in a sense. And then I'm usually editing some type of project uh, that is meant for sharing what I love or what our students are doing on social media or uh, eventually creating albums and things like that uh, to populate our website at uh, augie.edu slash music. And so I'm always just thinking about how can I use all of these skills that other people wish they had? That's the other thing. I mean, so many people are always turning to you to say, oh, it would be really cool if we could have like some music for this event. Like, guess what? You have the ability to provide that and they don't. So just teach yourself the other skills. And then instead of subcontracting out all of those other pieces, it's you who's making all that money, which is great. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's my vision for everything. I can tell, I can tell the students uh, uh, from firsthand experience, especially now during coronavirus that, that I'm, I'm doing all those things that you talked about. I'm now a video editor, as you've seen, you know, um, you guys have seen you, I've been editing your, your videos you sent to me and made a big collage uh, did the, with the symphony as well. I've done audio stuff. I mean, it, this stuff happens and, um, you know, part of, part of being a musician means you're a creative person and you like to make connections between the right. You talk about history and how that, that just sort of comes up. Right. I mean, there are, and that's a great thing. You can't avoid it. Right. But it, but what I loved about history was it, 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 it inspired connection. It inspired my, my search for connections between what's happening right now. How can our music, the music I'm being playing right now, even if it was written way back 200 years ago, how is it relevant to, to my life and the people in my community? Um, and I think it's really wonderful that there's, there's a school of music right here in our own town that, that is, is really investing in this versatility aspect of the 21st century musician. I appreciate that, Tom. And so, you know, I guess the, the one piece that I can share with all of you is uh, I talked about how we're elevated now. We've got a whole new scholarship structure for students. And again, this is whether you want to major in music or whether you want to double major in music, whether you want to minor in music, whether you don't want to even uh, have music as part of a degree plan, but you want to stay involved in music. Uh, we've got three new tiers of scholarship here. So uh, the first is our Pro Music Scholarship, which is $8,000 a year. Uh, and the requirements there are that you take private lessons and play in our ensembles, and we give you $8,000 a year, which really totals up to an entire year of college uh, free just for you sharing your gifts and continuing to study. Uh, so then if you've made all state, automatically you get a $3,000 scholarship. Um, it's not stackable with the $8,000, unfortunately, but so if, if you don't end up getting one of those $8,000 scholarships, but you made Allstate, which a lot of your students have, right, in the youth, youth orchestra, so um, automatically you get $3,000. And if you haven't made Allstate and you wanna participate in our marching band, which we're growing, uh, it's an, another automatic $3,000 scholarship for you. So um, we're, we're gonna be looking for more donors, for more gifts to create more scholarship opportunities, but those are pretty robust. Um, and I'm really excited about just recruiting a whole new generation of students that are interested in following this vision of kind of, okay, cool, I wanna do it all. I wanna take all the skills that I have already and I wanna build on everything that Dr. Follier just said. Um, yeah, so we're looking, especially for students from the Youth Orchestra, Tom. I mean, it's just an easy uh, plug-in. So if you're interested, just shoot me an email um, I, and you see me plenty. I hope I can work with you on some of the box stuff too. So maybe yeah. just stick around sometime and I'll get your number and. Uh, text you and we'll get you all set up. Excellent. Well, Dr. Foliard, Pete, thanks so much for, for jumping in, being our inaugural guest at the uh, SDSYO Symposium. So thanks again, Pete. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Tom. Really appreciate it, bud. You bet.